Lesson 7.7 .7 is modeling measurements that are distributed normally. In 7.5 and 7.6, we talked about discrete random variables. Now we're going to talk about continuous random variables. So the only difference is now we're talking about continuous data, so data that's found by measuring as opposed to being counted. Um, and then it's still random, so it's the result of a random process, and it's a variable, so it can take any value in the domain. And then uh, this example just had this domain, the example that I pulled this from. So we're talking about normal distributions, which um, is data that can be found on a bell-shaped curve, so something that looks like this, where it's uh, symmetric about the mean. So this is information about a normal distribution. I would pause the video and write down these notes. So x denotes the continuous random variable whose data can be modeled by a bell-shaped curve. We say that x is distributed normally with a mean mu, this is the Greek letter mu, and a standard deviation of sigma. The way that we notate it is x is distributed, the little tilde, normally is an n, and then the first thing here, mu, is your mean. And the second thing here, this is sigma squared, which is your variance. So you just, whatever is being squared, that would be your standard deviation. So our mean is mu and our variance is sigma squared. If you look at this chart down here, um, the probability is related to the area of the bar chart. So this would be an example of something that's distributed binomial, binomially with 11 trials and a probability of 0.5. And it ended up being a um, nice bell-shaped curve here. So notice it's symmetric about its mean of 5.5. And as you move away from the mean, the probability decreases. You can see the probability on the y-axis here. If you want to find a cumulative probability, you can find that by adding up the individual probabilities, which happen to be the heights of the bars. And then the total heights of all the bars add up to 1, because that's your total probability. So this is a pictorial representation of a normal distribution with your bell-shaped curve. So just some information about it. Um, the middle, where it's symmetric about, that's always going to be your mean. In this case, we call it mu. And then it's symmetric, so it's going to decrease the same either direction. The total area under the whole curve is 1 because it's probability. It all adds up to 1. And the height is the frequency. So in this case, since it's all symmetric about the mean, our mean, median, mode are actually all the same for a normal distribution. Some other information, um, some probabilities here. If you have your mean here and you go plus or minus one standard deviation from your mean, then 68.3% of your data falls in that. So the probability of being plus or minus one standard deviation is 68.3. Uh, two standard deviations, 95.4% of your data falls between two standard deviations for normal distributions, and between three standard deviations, 99.7% of the data falls within three standard deviations of the mean. So here's an example. It says T is the waiting time in seconds for a customer care representative of TechCo to respond to a customer's first question in an online chat session. You are given that T is distributed normally with a mean of 19 and a standard deviation of 1.3. So the first thing that we always do whenever we're doing a normal distribution problem is first we draw a picture. So we have our little bell curve here, and then we put the mean on. So our mean was at 19 minutes. And then for this first example, we want the probability that the time it took was less than 17 minutes. So you draw a little bar at 17, and in this case, we want less than, so we're going to graph everything that's smaller. So this is kind of your work for a normal curve, um, is the little picture here. And then we use our graphing calculator to actually find the probability. So the way that we're going to use our graphing calculator is you're going to go into second vars, which is distribution, and then we're going to go to number two, normal CDF, because we want it to be a cumulative up. So then it'll ask you for your lower bound, which is the smallest number you could possibly take. In this case, we're going to go all the way down like negative infinity. So the default, the calculator will already have this in here. It says negative 1E99, which is negative 1 with 99 zeros after it. Um, upper bound is the biggest number it can take. In this case, we want everything less than 17. So 17 is going to be our upper bound. Um, mean, the mu is whatever your mean is, so it's going to be 19 for this problem. And then sigma is whatever your standard deviation is, so whatever is being squared, which would be 1.3. And then you just hit paste, and whatever it tells you, that's going to be your probability. So if you do all that and you plug it in your calculator, you would end up with the probability that the time takes is less than 17 minutes is equal to 0 0.0620, or basically 6.2% chance that it's going to take less than 17 minutes. So go ahead and pause the video and try the same thing for t is less than or equal to 21. 
So first I drew my picture here. Um, I have my mean at 19, 21 is bigger than 19, so it's gonna be on the right of it, but then I still want everything less than, so I shave to the shade to the left. Um, and then I use my graphing calculator. Again, my smallest number is still gonna be this negative one E99, and I end up with a probability of 0 0.938. So one useful part of normal curves is there's a lot of symmetry. So for example, um, if you look at being greater than 21, because 17 and, 9, and 21 are the same distance away from the mean of 19, being greater than 21 has the same area, which means the same probability as being less than 17. So another way you could have done this problem is actually saying that, okay, being bigger than 21 is the same thing as being less than 17. And if you are bigger than 21 or you are less than 21, those have to add up to 1. So the probability that you are less than 21 would be 1 minus the probability that you're greater than 21, which is the same thing as being less than 17. So you could have actually used your answer from part A to help you with this part B. Just a useful thing to know about symmetry on normal curves. So go ahead and pause the video and try part B. C, we want to find the probability that T is greater than or equal to 20.3. One thing to note on this one, your upper bound, since you want it to go to positive infinity, you're going to need to type in 1E99, which is 1 second comma 99. So in this one, I drew my picture. I have my mean at 19, and then I want everything greater than 20.3. So there's my picture. And then my lower bound is going to be 20.3. My upper bound is going to be 1 e 99 so 1 second comma 99 and then my mean and my standard deviation didn't change and I end up with 0 0.159 another way you could have done this one is 20.3 is exactly up one standard deviation so you could have used the percentages on the previous slide to help you find it by using the fact that there's a symmetric with the standard deviations for the last example, it says the expected number of times the waiting time is less than 21 seconds in a sample of 107 chats collected by Techco Management. Um, so you're finding expected value. We talked about how to expected value with a sample or number of trials of 107, and then you want the probability to be less than 21, which you did in Part B. So go ahead and try and find the expected number of times. So I did number of trials, which was 107, times the probability that you're less than 21 seconds, which we found in part B to be 0 0.938. I multiplied those together, and we would expect it to be right around 100 times the waiting to be less than 21 seconds. So for this next example, it says the lengths of trout in a fish farm are normally distributed with a mean of 39 and a standard deviation of 6.1. So I wrote out my little notation, L for lengths are normally distributed, mean of 39, standard deviation of 6.1. So first thing we want to do is we want to find the probability that a trout caught in the fish farm is less than 35 centimeters long. So go ahead and pause the video and try that. So I drew my little picture first, I have my mean at 39, I want everything less than 35, and then I used my graphing calculator and found that the probability that L is less than 35 is 0 0.256. For part B, it says that Cliff catches five trout in an afternoon, and we want to find the probability that at least two of those trout are more than 35 centimeters long, and then state any assumptions that we make. Um, so this one is no longer a normal distribution. The lengths are normally distributed, but this situation here, it's a success or failure. Either they are 35 centimeters long or they're not. So now we're looking at a binomial distribution with five trials. So again, I wrote out my binomial distribution. C for Cliff is binomially distributed with five trials because he catches five fish. And then the probability that he's greater than 35 centimeters long would be one minus the probability that they're less than 35 centimeters long, so 0 0.744. So we want to find the probability that at least two of them are more than 35 centimeters long. So using what we did in the binomial distribution in the previous, in 7.6, go ahead and pause the video and try this one. So the way that I did it is I set up the probability that C is greater than or equal to 2, but for the binomial CDF, the calculator only does less than or equal to. So that would be the same thing as 1 minus the probability that C is less than or equal to 1. So basically 0 or 1. You could have also just added them all up. Um, I plugged this in my calculator using binomial CDF because I want it to be cumulative, and you end up with a probability of 0 0.983 that at least two of them are more than 35 centimeters long. 
For part C, it says find the probability that a trout caught is longer than 42 centimeters, given that it's longer than 40 centimeters. So we're going to our conditional probability, but we're going back to the trout, the length of the trout caught. So we're going back to this normal distribution here. So we want to find the probability that L is greater than 42, given that L is greater than 40. So using your conditional probability, go ahead and find this probability. Pause the video and do that. So the probability that L is greater than 42, given that L is greater than 40, if we use our conditional probability, we do the probability of the and divided by the probability of the second one. Well, if L is greater than 42 and L is greater than 40, that's just the same thing as L being greater than 42. So I did the probability that L is greater than 42 using my normal distribution on my graphing calculator divided by the probability that L is greater than 40, again using my normal distribution on my graphing calculator, and you end up with the probability of 0 0.716. So if you know the trout is more than 40 centimeters long, then the probability that it is more than 42 centimeters long is 0 0.716. And then the last question says determine whether the events, the length being more than 42 centimeters and the length being more than 40 centimeters are independent. So go back and look at what we talked about about independence and decide whether or not these two are independent from each other. So one way to prove independence is if you're given your conditional is equal to just what it would be without the conditional statement. So probability of A given B would be equal to probability of A. So I found the probability of just L is greater than 42 and got 0 0.311. And so the probability of the conditional is 0 0.716 and the probability of just the original is 0 0.311. So because those two things are equal, knowing that it was longer than 40 <clears throat> affected the probability. Therefore, they are not independent of each other. This last example says the weights W of cauliflowers purchased by a supermarket from their suppliers are normally distributed with a mean of 821 grams and a standard deviation of 40 grams. The heaviest 8% of cauliflowers are classified as oversized and repackaged. Find the range of weights of cauliflowers classified as oversized. Express your answer correct to the nearest gram. So in all the previous examples, we have been given um, our boundaries and asked to find the probability. In this case, we're given a probability and asked to find the boundary. So we know that the probability that W is greater than some weight little w is 0.088%. So I drew my picture here. I still centered it around the mean of 821. I drew my line at some unknown value of W, and I made it bigger than. And because it's small, this is an 8%, I made it a very small area over here as to graph this little 8% area. So we want to find the value of W that makes this true. So this is called an inverse normal problem. When you're going the inverse direction, you're finding the weight given the probability. So the way we're going to do this one is we're going to go into second VARS distribution, but this time we're going to go to number three, which is inverse normal. So it'll ask you for your area. Remember, area is probability. So whatever the probability they give you us, in this case 0 0.08, that's our area. Mu is still our mean. Uh, sigma is still our standard deviation. And then the newer calculators will ask you for the tail. The tail is which direction we're shading. So if we want a less than, that means we want a left tail. We're over here. If we have something like we're given a between two values, that's our center. That one won't show up very often. Um, and then a right tail is if you want greater than. We shade it over here to the right, so we want a right tail. Only the newer calculators will do it this way. The older calculators will only do left tail, and you actually have to adjust your problem. So go ahead and pause the video and try this one. So we have an area of 0 0.08, we have a mean of 821, we have a standard deviation of 40, and in this case we wanted a right tail because we wanted it to be greater than, so we end up with the boundary weight to be 877 grams. So anything greater than 877 grams would be calculated as classi or classified as oversized and have to be repackaged. So this section has been talking about normal distributions and finding uh, probabilities when something is distributed normally, or if we know something's distributed normally and we know the probability, being able to find the boundary lines.